Um, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a little bit under the weather, so I hope my voice carries all the way to the back. Um, uh, the, the little piece I'm going to present to you is um, sort of extracted from my last uh, book came up with Palgrave a couple of months ago, which is about the acceleration of the university. Um, so this, uh, th this book tries to sort of look at the um, intertwining um, value systems and morals that underlie the university and also underlie technological acceleration. So I want to open my paper with a quote by Paul Virilio, I'm a big fan of this uh, French uh, philosopher. And Virilio says, um, Quote, since everything is an illusion, it follows that scientific theory, like art, is merely a way of manipulating illusions. An omnivoyance, Western Europeans' totalitarian ambition, may here appear as the formation of a whole image by repressing the invisible. <coughs> now, the contemporary university finds itself, according to many critical commentators, the target of a widespread new liberalization. In Europe, this liberalization is implemented by member states by way of various mandates of and agreements with the European Union. These mandates range from enabling student mobility to helping a student body to make an informed choice as to their potential program and country of study. And the organization therefore arguably seeks to render universities more productive in terms of research outputs and the formation of graduates capable of working in the current economic environment. It also seeks to hold them accountable, the universities accountable, and render them transparent via outcome-oriented practices. This new form of accountability can be especially noted in the various forms of calculation, quantification, metrification, and visualization around its practices, which claim to improve and exhibit the quality and efficacy of research and teaching to students and citizens alike. In the Dutch context, for instance, teaching evaluations are exceedingly done via online forms that gather statistical data about student satisfaction, and this data in turn generates a score on a scale from one to five on various pedagogical and organizational elements of the course. It's lecturer, and this is then presented in an easy to read bar graph. I was thinking of bringing some of these bar graphs, but everybody knows these bar graphs, right, from teaching evaluations, so. Um, on the national scale, uh, Dutch undergrad and postgrad programs get a numerical grade via the so-called National Student Survey of Nationale Studenta Enquete, the NSE, in which students fill out an online list of evaluative queries in relation to the program they attend or have attended. The NSE outcomes are presented in grade-like scores that emulate the test scores that students typically receive at Dutch universities. And this ranges from one, which is abysmal, to 10, which is perfect. This score in turn gets posted in elegant visuals on the website of the department that offers the program in order to ensure optimal comparability. And the departments have nothing to say about the posting of these scores. And they have to do this. So besides aiming to facilitate the choice of study and city for prospective students so that, as Graham Allen notes in his critique of the EU Bologna agreements, the student is treated, I quote, as a client requiring a transparent and quality product, unquote. The justification of the survey is also to aid the perfection of these programs. The NSC website, for instance, claims that, I quote, objective information about universities, schools, and their course programs can be used to improve the quality of Dutch higher education. And student ratings, the website continues, give unique insights into student satisfaction with their higher education programs. Who better to rate a program than the students who are already enrolled? Unquote. In other words, the number that the NSE generates for each department is assumed to be a more objective and democratically gathered score directly coming from the students because the noise of all kinds of excuses by a program and its staff and management have been eradicated. Of course, these types of evaluative practices are an outflow of the starkly consumer-oriented ideology that pervades the neoliberal economy, in which universities need to pay heed to what their present and future clientele needs or wants. Higher education hence seems to have been downgraded to a mere business that casts its students as mere consumers of knowledge and skills. And the result of this is that university staff too find themselves increasingly exposed to economistic pressures and rationalities and that quantification becomes a background model in which to frame all forms of assessment. 
as lecturers, we often encounter bizarre outflows of this in the pedagogical scene. Just last week, for instance, a colleague of mine had to explain to students that the individual remarks on their essays should not be added up to an overall number designating how well they did for the essay, but that different remarks carry different imports. It's very complicated for these students to understand. Likewise, students read thesis assessment forms as a tick-the-box model, arguing without any regard for holistic aspects that if all elements are present in the thesis, the thesis should pass. Now, those who decry the neo neoliberal transformation the suggest that actually the superior goals of the traditional university have been squandered under this new regime of neoliberal consumer and product-oriented managerialism. Moreover, they argue that this has rather had a detrimental effect on the quality, if not necessarily quantity, of research output and sound pedagogy. These critical commentators, not without reason, lament the neoliberal university as one where the oppression of numbers trumps the necessarily unmeasurable quality of fundamental science and philosophy. philosophy. And they conclude that the neoliberal university has become a place where professors and students are exploited by a management that is largely clueless about and even maliciously resistant to what is perceived as the true purpose of the university, that of independently pursuing justice, knowledge, truth, and emancipation. In a short indictment, um, which is called From Ivory Tower to Glass House, former chairman of the Dutch Association of Universities, Carl Dietrich, chides the contemporary university for having lost its original independence, even if he considers the fact that universities are forced to be accountable to the public a positive development. Now, I'd say that such nostalgic notions of the old independent university are extremely problematic. This is especially because the university was never, of course, truly independent, whether in, its terms, in terms of its organization, administration, or intellectual content. In fact, many of the original theories, ideas, and regulations of the neoliberal market economy were developed by economists and philosophers also, with either an academic position or at least with a solid academic pedigree. One may think here, for instance, of Walter Eucken from the Freiburg School and Milton Friedman from the Chicago School both of whom have developed the cornerstones of the neoliberal economy from within prominent universities. Likewise, as Ryan Bishop points out in his tracing of the relation between the US university and the military, the university has played what he calls an integral, if almost silent role, in the development of all kinds of information gathering technologies, cybernetic systems, and engineering-oriented models of noise cancellation that typically came out of collaboration with military <coughs> endeavors. And such technology, says Bishop, have in turn pried open the university in order to render it increasingly <coughs> integrated in the global economy. The forerunner of the internet, of course, the ARPANET, as well as the computational systems and ideologies of objectivity and transparency that at base make possible something like the Dutch National Student Survey, were thus developed by a handful of Western universities. Not importantly, they did this with the help of military monies whose interests were firmly tied up in global imperialism. The peculiar case is, therefore, that the university appears to succumb to those neoliberal theories and technologies of social selection and quantification that it at least in large part itself has brought forth. This means that it would be a mistake to understand a phenomenon like the new evaluative practices as a mere onslaught from the outside by the neoliberal economy or the European Union. I propose rather that the university, in its basis, suffers from a peculiar autoimmune disease bound up in its foundational ideal of total vision and knowledge. And I suggest that this autoimmunity becomes most apparent in the case around the benefits and drawbacks of the digital humanities and the increasing encroachment of big data techniques and visualizations in the humanities at large. Now, proponents of the implementation of big data research in the humanities, often carried out under those auspices of the digital humanities, have so far argued their case by suggesting that the gathering and visualization of data has the potential for unexpected insights into social and human activity. These advocates claim that even if any data visualization is necessarily bound by a set of subjective and technical choices, Big data research may enrich the humanities with previously hidden perspectives on cognition, emotion, and society. Instead, opponents of this implementation in turn lament the increasing encroachment of techniques of calculation and quantification into the humanities 
and argue that such techniques signal the demise of the rich practices of close reading and the necessarily boundedness of interpretation to an embodied social and cultural context. Richard Grusin, for instance, notes perceptively that the rise of the digital humanities coincided with the deepening of the economic crisis that has negatively affected the critical strength of the humanities. And he suggests, in turn, that the central disagreement between the digital and the critical humanist consists of a tension between critique and production, and that the digital humanities therefore precisely have fallen prey to what he calls the neoliberal values that have been seen to be the cause of the current crisis. Rusin and I with him therefore takes issue with the problematic claim to objectivity and depth that the dominant discourse around big data presents and dismisses the digital humanities in general as a largely misguided means to help humanities departments survive. Correctly chiding nonetheless those who assume that critical work does not consist of making things and data, Rusin finally proposes, I quote, that humanists should be working together to defend the value of humanistic inquiry in and of itself from the instrumental logic and systematic defunding brought about by the neoliberal assault on higher education. <clears throat> so what to make of these paradoxes where the digital appears as the destroyer as well as the saving grace of the university? And what may a closer look at the exemplary subjects or objects of the quantification of learning, namely our students tell us here? I propose that the turn to big data and humanities in fact signals a much profounder conundrum in academic research ever since its idealistic beginnings in enlightenment thought, of which neoliberalization is only its logical progression. This deeper problem pivots around the contradictory claim that big data equally renders its objects of analysis more superficial and unknowable, as well as more penetrable or knowable. This contradiction parallels what I call the imminent aporia of the academic enterprise and the double nature of its responsibility towards society. So that is institution, institutional mission of exposing the world and humanity to the light of truth and emancipation, and thereby also its negative historical baggage of oppressive universalism, social scrutiny, elitism, and colonialism, have, to, have today deconstructed themselves by finally exposing the limits of its own idealism. This indeed means that the quest for total knowledge and transparency has started to become a near pervasive exposing itself of academia by way of the implementation of a plethora of internal and external forms of surveillance carried out via extensive datification of staff and student behavior. In the heat of the debates around the datification and the digital humanities then, we can see quite clearly that the problem of the university today consists not simply of its neoliberalization, but of the acceleration of the university's unfinishable idealistic mission by way of an enmeshment and displacement of its aporia into technologies of calculation and prediction, like big data techniques. Big data could therefore be said to be the exemplary contemporary symptom of the apparatic structure of the university, as it can be read as an allegory of how the expansion of knowledge about, as well as the unknowability of the world, society, and human cognition, remains fundamentally conjoined today. This means that eventually graphs, like the module evaluation and the national student surveys, are best un understood as illusory aesthetic objects that ironically erase, rather than communicate, all that our students potentially are and can be. And doing justice to them by tracing their supposed needs and wants exceedingly today entails the enactment of an obscured injustice. It is therefore in the silence of these graphs, in the cracks left by those too tired, too recalcitrant, or too cynical to vote, that may tell us more about the state of our universities today than all those pretty statistical bars together. Thank you. So thanks very much. Um, what I'm going to present today is a work in progress, essentially, um, to see if people have ideas that can help to uh, bring it forward to its next stage. Uh, this is a paper I've been working on for a while. It, it originally focused just on one of the case studies that we talked about, which is the Volkswagen scandal. Um, and as I began to think about that more, I realized there was more to the story uh, than I'd initially thought. So what I'm trying to do is to explore the consequences of smart devices on the internet of things uh, broadly. And to get us to think a bit more, I think, about the multi-directional dialectic essentially within these interactive technologies. Um, and I think the question I'm trying to raise is how do we ensure that these Internet of Things devices um, 
operate in an ethical, moral fashion that is in line with public policy. Um, and that's not a question that has an easy answer. Actually, I don't really have any good answers to that question uh, at all. We'll see where we get with it. Um, so, to begin, just a bit of context, first of all, the Internet of Things, probably most people here are, are part of that phrase, but uh, just briefly, um, it involves um, electronic devices, which are now very widely embedded in physical infrastructure and also uh, in the uh, broader world outside of buildings as well. They will involve uh, sensors, they'll involve communication chips, uh, they will involve connections to computers, more powerful computers, uh, servers somewhere where they can feed uh, data to, uh, and they will obviously operate uh, over the internet. Uh, and these raise a lot of uh, issues around privacy and control of data. There's a lot of talk at this conference, not other conferences these days, about big data, but Internet of Things devices often the issue is little data, the little traces that we leave behind uh, in all of these uh, particular things. That's not so much the focus of my presentation, but it's some, somewhere of where we're going. Um, now, the Internet of Things has some very significant advantages for dealing with some things that are very complex and problematic and also very important. Uh, improving uh, manufacturing, for example, making driving safer, uh, improving uh, health outcomes for individuals and populations. Uh, law enforcement obviously has a lot of interest in uh, gathering, processing, analyzing the data that we gather through these things. Uh, personally, one of the areas that, that I uh, look at a lot is environmental protection, environmental regulation of the uh, data that can be gathered from Internet of Things sensors can be hugely useful in, in all of that. So some people talk about the idea of a smart state uh, which would use all this Internet of Things data to operate in a much more rapid and interactive fashion, uh, dealing with issues like air quality, for example, uh, in, in a way that's much more responsive, uh, also the development of um, tools for uh, generating and delivering electricity, like the smart grid, and being able to respond to emergencies in a quicker fashion. So the, the, the direction in which that sort of discourse goes is towards the sort of perfect central control, the, the digital panoptica essentially. Uh, and uh, what I want to do in, in, in my presentation today is just to raise some uh, questions about that, that, that this probably is not really achievable, um, and to see how we can achieve the positive aspects of that without uh, the, the downsides. As I said at the beginning, this paper started out looking uh, just at the uh, relatively recent uh, Volkswagen scandal. I presume most of you are at least generally familiar with it. Anybody here who actually has a Volkswagen? <laughs> <laughs> um, one, this one. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so pretty much any time I've presented this or talked about this, I have come across somebody who's been directly affected by <coughs> zero product cars uh, involved. So just again, by way of background, again, you may know some of the back of some of this already. I apologize if I'm uh, telling you things you know. Um, but Volkswagen has had um, a somewhat um, a troubled relationship with regulators for quite a while in the U.S. It was subject to a consent decree uh, in 2005 for failing to report a, a, a defective exhaust part. Um, but um, in 2008, it began to use what's uh, known as a defeat device uh, in its cars. And a defeat device, for those who haven't heard of this before, is essentially a um, software embedded within the car's control systems, which can detect when it's being tested. Uh, the particular test here was for uh, nitrogen oxide uh, emissions. Uh, and these tests are standardized, so the car can actually, uh, if the software is written correctly, the car can tell that it's now being uh, tested in the laboratory under conditions that are not the same as normal uh, road driving uh, conditions. And it's possible that they began to use this as a temporary measure. They were trying to meet emission standards. They could, they thought, well, we'll just fudge it for a little while. We'll, 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 our technologists will eventually uh, catch up. We don't really know entirely. Um, but there were suspicions around the use of these types of devices, and I should stress that this isn't necessarily just a problem with Volkswagen, it's a problem across the, uh, the diesel uh, car industry in general. Europe. Um, a, an NGO called the International Council uh, on Clean Transportation was interested in looking at this uh, more closely. They contracted investigative work to uh, Western University, West University, First West Virginia University, uh, who published some preliminary report results in 2014, which indicated that there were problems with uh, the uh, Volkswagen cars. And eventually, Volkswagen admitted that there was this uh, particular uh, problem. Uh, the um, consequences of this have been quite significant for Volkswagen management. It's a, uh, had a people who have resigned 
there are about 10 and a half million cars worldwide that have been affected. Uh, again, this isn't just a problem with Volkswagen. It seems there are similar devices in other uh, Porsche cars. Um, and uh, there are also issues which really have nothing to do with uh, my particular topic, uh, with uh, data around uh, fuel efficiency uh, in uh, other contexts and other jurisdictions, like Mitsubishi Motors in Japan. Uh, admitted recently that it's been submitting non data to Japanese regulators for a long time, something which cost him, I think, some of the capital value. Um, so, I suppose the point there is although what I'm going to talk about is digital cheating, cheating happens in a lot of kind of contexts as well. So, as I said, I started thinking about Volkswagen, but then as I thought about it more, I realized there were other aspects uh, to this, uh, particularly to Internet of Things devices. Um, one of the things that can happen in this context is that these devices can be used for surveillance, uh, obviously. Um, so some of this is done by uh, government. We don't know an awful lot about what, what, what is happening there. Uh, at the moment, one of the things that um, law enforcement agencies uh, worldwide are concerned about is that um, their surveillance capabilities are, are going dark, that's the term that they like to use, because there's a lot more emphasis and interest, consumer interest in encryption. Um, but it's possible that the Internet of Things might provide them with another way of, of surveilling individuals uh, because there are devices that are now becoming increasingly commonplace, like smart TVs, uh, like domestic robots, uh, like fitness trackers, as possible they in the room and have full business on their devices. And these can enable quite a detailed level of surveillance and tracking and can leak data uh, quite a lot. You you can also see uh, instances of uh, this type of surveillance being conducted uh, by, um, I don't know if you call them civil society, maybe on civil society groups uh, like Hackback and Anonymous who posted, who hacked the Bilderberg uh, website in December 2016 and they posted a message, just an excerpt from it there, uh, which uh, stresses the extent to which they can surveil people that they see as the rich and control. Um, and, um, there have also been instances where um, commercial companies have placed products in the market that proved to be insecure um, and that could easily uh, be used as tools for surveillance. So a couple from the sort of um, uh, children's toy uh, end, uh, there, there are actually a lot of examples of this, and as I began to research this paper, I began to sort of notice and collect these. So I could actually go to a list of about 20 or 30 different examples of this sort of thing, not all of which involve uh, toys. Uh, I don't think that'd be terribly useful in the summer time, so I'm not going to do it. These are just the ones that I've sort of collected in the early stages of this research. But uh, the Genesis Toys had uh, voice recognition software built into their uh, toys, so the children could talk to these uh, devices. This was a secure mechanism. Uh, and I think that's the one my friend Carla on the slide there. Uh, that particular toy is banned in Germany as being a surveillance device. Uh, there are tools called Cloud Pets, uh, which are basically uh, two way conversations between parent and child in an uh, asynchronous, essentially sending a voicemail to your child when you're away from home. Uh, those communications methods weren't uh, secure and they were hacked. And then uh, VTech uh, had a significant breach uh, two years ago, I think, maybe three years, uh, where they had the data of uh, up on five million uh, families uh, hacked uh, into their placed online in an insecure fashion. So, uh, these Internet of Things devices, as I said, these are just examples to give to the icebergs for the taste, uh, but there's huge potential for surveillance. We also have an issue with what are called botnets, which is uh, basically where Internet of Things devices are um, are subverted or controlled by often by criminals, uh, sometimes maybe by uh, by government agencies as well, uh, and can be used for things like denial of service attacks uh, or for surveillance uh, because some crossover here, uh, these types of devices may be uh, things like uh, security cameras or baby monitors. Um, and um, so these devices are often inherently insecure, they're small, they have uh, low uh, power usage, they don't have very much capacity for security, they're not updated, uh, they're intended to be connected and accessible, the market is very heterogeneous, uh, and security is just not an industry priority. These things are, are mass manufactured. Uh, uh, and often not intended to, to be um, uh, really maintained over a long period of time. So this is just a, a, an image of one particular plot that just to give you an idea of the size of the reach of these things. Um, so to move towards some sort of uh, conclusion, um, these 
um, devices allow uh, cheating, cheating in, in ways that are new. There's a quote from Bruce Schneer, who's a, a very well-known computer security person. Maybe I'll just give you a moment to read what he has to say there. So essentially what uh, I'm trying to argue is that this technology is becoming a, a, a black box. These, are, these devices are very uh, commonly used, they're becoming key to uh, power relationships. Um, and um, we, from a legal perspective, so law is the background that I'm coming from, we tend to assume that when uh, an artifact is placed out on there on the market, it doesn't change after it's being manufactured and after it's being deployed. So we try and regulate it at some sort of initial stage, and we're not really very good at regulating something that uh, not only changes, uh, but changes in ways that are uh, unpredictable and, and hard uh, to detect. Uh, so this creates a significant challenge. So the label that I'm using for these kinds of things are chameleon devices. These are devices that perform some sort of new or hidden function, but there in plain sight you can see that there is this thing there, you just don't know exactly uh, what it's doing. And maybe it's doing that by design. It's like your, your Volkswagen car, which is uh, essentially uh, cheating on emissions tests. Or maybe it's being subverted by a government agency or by a criminal uh, or uh, by some sort of quasi-political organization as well. Um, in order for something to be a chameleon device, it needs to be a computer. It probably needs to be network connected. It needs to have some method of input and output so it can detect its environment and respond to it. So it's probably, but not necessarily, in chameleon devices, you can have uh, chameleon devices that, like uh, devices in a Volkswagen car, which are uh, 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 defeat devices, I suppose, generally not to be common in Volkswagen, um, which um, are designed at the point of manufacture in order to respond uh, to uh, particular types of uh, testing, for example. Uh, one of the things that I uh, noticed uh, literally yesterday uh, when I was um, just checking on, on news and so on is that these types of devices have also been uh, just programming, I suppose. Have also been found in smart TVs. Uh, smart TVs will switch into a low, low power mode when they, know, when they detect that certain video clips are being played because these clips are part of the standard for uh, testing for low power. Mode. So these things are going to be out there in, in a lot of different uh, contexts and environments and products. Okay, so um, to begin to wrap up, then just very briefly, where are the kinds of types of um, um, environments or, or, or uses or applications that these types of devices might have. Well, we've already talked about defeat devices. I'm not going to repeat that around too much. Surveillance devices, as we've talked about, so we need to go back to that again. But these things could also be weapons. Uh, there's a lot of debate at the moment, a lot of discussion around autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles, but I don't see very much discussion about the possibility that they could be used as weapons. Uh, I think if you have uh, particularly buses and trucks that are driving around uh, controlled by computers, um, if th those um, vehicles are uh, contactable, addressable over the internet, then uh, it's only a matter of time before someone will uh, eventually uh, circumvent controls uh, and use them uh, as weapons to drive into a crowd, for example. Uh, these could be tools for vandalism, particularly if you think about the children's toy context. Uh, if you can take over uh, a large number of children's toys, you could uh, use them to, uh, for example, simply broadcast or speak uh, obscene or offensive messages. Uh, just because it seems to be at the time, which is the sort of thing that sometimes happens online. But they could also be used for uh, political control. You could, uh, if you have control over an environment, you could make movement more difficult. You could, for example, disable all or most of the vehicles in a particular area that you don't want people to vote from. You could make getting access to public transport or buildings more difficult from a particular area. Or you could simply tamper with the voting machines. Uh, the rest of that quote from Bushnir that I showed earlier, he talked about voting machines that work perfectly except on one particular day of the year. <laughs> um, these things could also be witnesses in legal context. There was an interesting uh, case in Arkansas um, last year, where, or early this year, I think, where um, law enforcement wanted to get access to an Amazon Echo device uh, because uh, the owner of the uh, Echo was uh, being charged with murder. Uh, and initially, Amazon were not keen to have this, the recordings from this device over. Uh, but the defendant consented to it, so we never actually got the court case to determine whether or not this could be, uh, uh, could, could be required. So, um, I see I've been getting a red, red, red flag there, so I've got to wrap up. Uh, so very briefly, this is essentially where I'm at and, and, and where I'm curious to get people's thoughts on. How do we deal with this? Um, 
do we need to think about reforming innovation policy? There are some who argue that we need actually even less regulation in this area. We need an anti-precautionary um, uh, policy. In other words, favoring the innovator, uh, or do we need to reform the market so that these kinds of insecure devices can be placed on there? Where does the burden of proof in terms of making sure that devices are secure to lie? How do we think beyond simply binary perspectives? It seems to be a lot of technology is good, technology is bad. I think it could be good or bad. Uh, how do we work to uh, make it better? A couple of ideas along those lines in terms of, of um, rebuilding the sort of trust that I think has been eroded in these technologies. Um, none of which are particularly good, um, but at least are one of the ideas that I have. Uh, do we need to think about uh, labeling standards that can be placed on these devices so that when you buy your baby monitor or whatever it tells you if it says a bronze or a, a, a silver or a gold star in terms of security, which is not the sort of information that's really available to consumers at the moment, it's difficult for them to understand. Do we need to require manufacturers to make source code for their devices available so that people can look at it and actually see what is going on, whether or not it's secure? Are there things in here that we don't expect this software to be doing? That's very hard to reconcile with copyright, very hard to reconcile with trade secrets. So that's going to be very challenging to make that right. Do we need to think about licensing for um, software engineers so that uh, they have clear ethical standards that they adhere to? One of the things that's very interesting about the Volkswagen case is that um, this was not an accident, this was not a mistake. This was a deliberate effort. We don't know quite how far up in the hierarchy of Volkswagen, but a group of engineers sat down and said, how do we make our car cheat on these tests? And the, the interesting question is, why did nobody say, this is not a, an ethical thing to do, or is it not going to do it? Maybe somebody did, but there should be enough of those people saying, no, I'm not going to do this. And finally, do we need to think more about uh, participatory assessment and governance of new technologies so that uh, we can um, have more people involved in the design and development of new technologies, particularly global technologies that need to be uh, so that uh, these kind of ethical and moral questions can be raised during that discussion. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Um, so my co-author, Joseph Zeller, sends his regrets that he can't be here today. Um, the argument that I'm going to attempt to uh, convince you of uh, suggests that perhaps infomediation services uh, can help us to resolve Nissenbaum's transparency paradox. So that's one of the things that I, uh, we're arguing today and we're going to be developing into a full paper. So yes, I'm beginning with Aristotle. Uh, so responding to uh, conceptions of an overly idealistic society described by Socrates, Aristotle remarks, in framing an ideal, we may assume what we wish, but should avoid impossibilities. Uh, I begin with this quote for two reasons. Uh, Aristotle reminds us that as we engage in what's called the frenetic approach for the purpose of political decision making, uh, meaning when we engage in the balancing of what Fleifberg calls instrumental rationality with value rationality, that is the balancing of pragmatism with normative ends, when we make decisions as a society, we must choose a balance that is both directed by these normative ends and will actually achieve results, pragmatic results. Uh, if the imbalance is off, if you have too much pragmatism, you end up with all sorts of moral failures. Anybody who's done a critique of neoliberalism knows this all too well. On the other hand, and what I'll be talking about today, um, too much value rationality, too much normativity, too much idealism, while it sounds good, it makes us warm and fuzzy to talk about activism and self-governance, right? As we are immersed in the big data deluge, too much idealism fails to produce results, fails to produce privacy and reputation protections, right? So this is the concern that I'm going to be talking about today and how do we address it, right? The second reason that I begin with Aristotle is because um, when we talk about big data, everything kind of feels new. Right? Except when we talk about the data sets, right? A lot of the data sets are not so new, and that's one of the big problems, right? Um, but because a lot of this stuff feels new, it suggests that all of the solutions have to be new as well. What we're arguing in this paper is that, well, actually, we can draw a lot from historical example, and we should take comfort in this, because it means that the debates have taken place, in fact, at least for a thousand years, about how to address some big data challenges, believe it or not. That's one of the things I'm going to try and convince you of today. And again, we should uh, take comfort in this. So what's this uh, problematic imbalance, this impossibility, this too idealistic uh, 
notion that I, and we're critiquing, notice and choice privacy policy. This is the approach that the government in Canada, in the US, in the EU, around the world, has uh, implemented for many years to try and deliver privacy protections. And they, have, they continue to fail to do so because it's an overly idealistic model. It's a great place to start, a terrible place to finish. So very quickly and too briefly, what is notice and choice privacy policy? It's the framework uh, spread by first the FTC and then the OECD and in implemented into law, designed to put individuals in charge of their data. Two main components for our current purposes. Notice, uh, users should get information about what's going on with their data. This is how we get privacy policies. And choice, similar to your ability to check a credit score before you go to the bank. Right? You should have the ability to control your data, so to go and check it, and if it's wrong, uh, correct it, right? Okay, so, notice and choice has proven to be a huge failure in many respects. Uh, again, this is a sort of a long thing to describe. I'll describe it quickly. Uh, it's been written about, uh, failures have been written about by Lori Craner and Joel Reidenberg, and of course, most notably by Daniel Salove. Uh, my co-author, uh, Anil Dorf Hirsch, and on, on this other paper, and I have written about this, I've written about it uh, in Big Data and Society in a paper called Big Data and the Phantom Public. So this is the problem with notice policy. So we did a study, it's under academic review, called The Biggest Lie on the Internet. Uh, we set up the front page of a fake social networking site and told participants, it was a survey, that they were going to be engaging in a pre-launch evaluation of the site. What we actually did was tested their engagement with the consent materials to see like what was going on here, right? The biggest lie on the internet, I agree to these terms and conditions. Right. Um, surprise, surprise, three quarters of more than 500 participants chose what's called the click wrap. Check the box, click join, don't actually go to the policy, but agree to it, right? Sound familiar? Okay, how many of you are on the wireless here and read the policy, right, before you agree to it? Uh, big data experts, right? Uh, but not engaging with the policies of the wireless providers that are here. What are they doing with your data? Anyhow, uh, of the remaining quarter of the 500 that participated, when we asked them, like, uh, or rather when uh, we looked at their data, we found that basically they spent the majority of their time, about 30 seconds, scrolling to the bottom to click agree. When we asked these participants, why didn't they read the policies? They said things that other academics have proven time and time again, and that you've probably felt yourself. Policies are too long, they're annoying, uh, there's too many of them, why should I spend all this time doing it? This is the problem with notice policy, right? It's not realistic. There are too many policies, they're too long, and we have better things to do. Choice, here's the failure with choice. So this is Max Schrems famous for being the first person to successfully get his data from Facebook. 1,200 printed pages for two years of use. This is the problem with choice. If your neighbor gets, is you know, not a law student, right? Your neighbor gets their 5,000 pages from Facebook for five years of use, then what? What do they do with it? They got it, right? Now what do they do with it? How do they, do they check through it and then contact Facebook and say, you know, like, this algorithm that you've got here isn't working properly, or apparently, so can you fix this, right? Um, this is one part of the choice problem. The broader and bigger component of the problem is not the Schrems issue, it's the Noam Galai issue. Noam Galai had his image stolen from Flickr a number of years ago, and it's been misappropriated hundreds if not thousands of times across the internet, right? This is a good analogy for the digital dossiers that exist about you. For Galai, this was his image, but this could just as easily be the digital dossiers that exist about you all over the world with data brokers, with you know, the different apps that you engage with, with advertisers, with our marketers, right? When Goli was asked, like, did you go after all these different commercial and non-commercial and political and activist organizations using your image? He said, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna do that? I don't have the money to hire lawyers in all these different countries and I don't even know if I would be able to do anything about it, right? So not only do we have the Schrems problem with all the data, we have the Goli problem, which is how do you you know, deal with your data being everywhere. A good way and a quick way to sort of wrap this up and see uh, how we can address this uh, in sort of like a very straightforward way is to look at Nissenbaum's transparency paradox, which says that if we don't give people enough information, we don't give them any notice or choice, then you can't have what's called autonomous authorization, right? If people don't know what's going on. How could they ever consent? How could they ever have control? But if you give people too much, the other end of the spectrum, then you end up with the Schrems and the Goliath problem. So what we argue 
is that info mediation, uh, as Nora Draper has written about, is a potential solution, a potential balancing of value rationality and instrumental rationality. And as I write in Big Data and the Phantom Public, a plan for data privacy self-management should express the true possibilities of its subject. And perhaps info mediation provides that, that true possibility. So let me describe how we, and again, this is mainly the theoretical foundation for our paper. Info mediation presents us with what's called a principal agent relationship. Principal agent relationship, and this will sound familiar, involves an individual or an organization, a principal, delegating responsibility to an, a representative, an agent, to achieve an advantageous division of labor, right? You don't grow your own food usually, you don't make your own clothes, you don't run the government, you delegate this task, right? This relationship is often necessary because the tasks delegated to the agent would other, otherwise be too complex, time-consuming, or burdensome for the principal. Does this sound like anything I've been talking about? Right. The problem with the principal-agent relationship that exists between you and the data carrier, so like with Facebook, is that there's what's called an information asymmetry. And this is essentially what the notice and choice model reveals, right? Um, and what a lot of us have been talking about at this conference, the fact that they know a lot about what's going on and we don't. And they control a lot and we don't, right? So that's a bit of a problem with this principal agent relationship. They're called an object agent because they're sort of like at the end of the relationship. An information agent on the other hand, perhaps an info mediary, could help us to address this information asymmetry because the information agent uh, is more interested in addressing the asymmetry than perhaps the object agent is. So what might the um, information agent do? Help us with consent processes, help us with collection and disclosure analysis, right? So you get your 5,000 pages from Facebook and they're helping you maybe to, to deal with it. Uh, eligibility protections, and this is of course what most privacy advocates are concerned about these days, right? Like the, the White House's uh, Big Data and Civil Rights Report says, no surprises, right? You don't go to the bank and surprise, they know how many times you've eaten at McDonald's for the last year before they give you life insurance, you know, stuff like that. Also security, of course. So what we're aiming to do in this exploratory work is to look at what this information, info mediation model might look like. So what Nora has written about in, previously is that pre-early like info mediation attempts, especially in the 90s, failed. And you may have heard of some of these strategies like trying to like monetize people's data for themselves, right? Like get paid when a company uses your data and stuff like that. It didn't it hasn't worked? So what we're looking for is uh, a way to make this work, a way to make this work, to develop a set of best practices for this emerging industry. There are examples uh, of info mediation services that we're going to look at and draw from an interview, but referring back to Aristotle and how we can learn from prior examples and prior debates for how to make this work, this is what we're going to be doing. So Joseph is a historian and he's helping me working together doing a historical analysis for this paper. So how is it that uh, every year people file their taxes? This is like a mammoth undertaking, isn't it? The tax code is very complicated. The tax documents are very complicated. There's a lot to deal with and it's very complicated. They say complicated enough, <laughs> right? But somehow, most of the people file their taxes. And they do so in a way that actually will get the money back a lot for a lot of us, right? So uh, the tax accountant that people hire or the tax software that people use helps people manage this very complicated system. And it's a very big, it's a very big job. So we're looking to tax accounting as a model for info mediation services that might lend to the development of best practices for in the big data context. So something interesting that we found, uh, an old, uh, a, sur a survey from uh, the IRS, and, they and again, does this sound familiar, right? Ask people, like, why do you hire a tax accountant? Well, those forms are so complicated, and I'm afraid of making mistakes. I don't have time to do this. I, I work, right? I can't spend all the t my time figuring this out. And lastly, it's not just about protections, it's about benefits. I hope the preparer would save me some money. So one potential best practice that we were drawing from uh, 
tax accountants is the oversight mechanisms. So the development of societies, <laughs> the development of industry standards, and also government oversight mechanisms as well, central to ensuring that these accountants uh, previously worked uh, in, in a way that was beneficial to the people that they were working with, uh, but also we're suggesting that this is something that infomediaries might also learn from. Lawyers, this is the other example. So think about all that a lawyer does, right? They begin with a client interpreting a scenario through a legal lens. They use their expertise to help them do that. They interpret the law, which again is very complicated and abundant. Thinking about jurisprudence here, right? And the ability to build a strong case. There's the case preparation process, which includes both procedure and strategy, and the presentation, which also includes procedure and strategy. The lawyer also is working with the client at all times, where they're translating and working towards agreement <coughs> with the goal of having a beneficial outcome. This is something that uh, apparently has been going on for about a thousand years. So we can take hope in this. So in Plucknett's uh, History of Common Law, again, does this sound familiar? As soon as business was entrusted to deputies, it became necessary to confine them with a routine, a strict procedure. The emergence of a professional uh, lawyer industry. These in turn necessitated the growth of the legal profession, for the public could hardly be expected to understand the newly invested office machinery of the King's Court. The attorney was a great convenience to wealthy landowners, a point that I'll pause on for a minute, right? This is something that certainly the government intervention component will address so that it's not just the wealthy that are going to benefit from info mediation services, something that's been a critique, of course, of uh, the right to be forgotten debate, right? Landowners found it troublesome to appear personally. There's the time component again. Law was becoming so complicated. There's that word again, complicated. Again, a thousand years ago, concerns about the complicated systems we were connected to. The need for further assistance of a different kind. Over many years, it's been determined that the lawyer is also a translator. And think back to that uh, information agent image that I had there, um, diagram. The lawyer was a translator, both translating the client's work to the court, but also the court's messages and procedures back to the client. So again, much that we can draw from here. Just something that is another sort of component of the procedure that's interesting. Here's an, a very controversial, so sort of a long story, ad from a lawyer. Preparation of all court papers and instructions on how to do your own simple, uncontested divorce. Right? It might be nice to see something like this, like in terms of big data protection, right? Automated software systems for helping us to manage our data in a way that will both be simple and effective. So, as I conclude, this is basically the last slide. The, what we're working towards is a, a set of data infomediation best practices. We assume it will in include translation services of some kind, automated document preparation. So you go into the, in, uh, the infomediary and they help you engage in the consent process. Now this is something that we're going to have to really expand upon and address because this is the uh, the Galai challenge presents something that is fairly unique. This is something that's very new, right? How do we address the fact, see, with the, with the legal analogy and the tax account analogy, there's just sort of one object agent that you're struggling with, the government or the court. With the Galai issue, you've got multiple dossiers, multiple data brokers that you're trying to deal with. So how do you uh, end up with a standardized process that can empower you in that respect? Security, and then, of course, oversight, which I've referred to. And lastly, and something else I'm working on uh, with Amit Schechter, uh, funding mechanisms. We're uh, working towards a distributed data justice model, which suggests that if there are going to be funding mechanisms for info mediation services, they need to be targeted at the communities most likely to be affected by big data discrimination, the vulnerable communities. Okay. So uh, just lastly, our, our interviews that we're starting to do now, uh, and I hope to do soon, are with uh, a variety of uh, reputation management uh, providers, services, 
that offer services in Canada and around the world, and we hope, again, to develop this set of best practices. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you.